Greg and Travis. Um, you're on a mic, so we can hear you guys talking. Just letting you know that you're doing anything wrong. Just letting you know. Okay? Mr. Greg McMichael, Travis McMichael, you all can hear and see everybody? Yes, yes sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. I've got... I don't have everybody present. Mr. Rubin, when we broke, you indicated there were some documents you wish to put in the room. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, at this time, on behalf of Travis McMichael, we would tender into evidence Mr. Mc, uh, Travis McMichael Exhibit Number 28, which is a letter from Kurt Hall, uh, a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, a self-described multiracial man with brown complexion and an old friend of Travis McMichael. This has been provided to the state in advance. I think it's been provided to the court, but I may be wrong um, on that. Uh, to at this point, tender uh, number 28 in the evidence. For what it's worth, no objection. Well, we hope it's worth a lot. Um, let's see. Is Ms. Moore getting the exhibits? If I was regularly in this courtroom, I was going to get this for that question. Judge, I don't know if the, uh, the court has a copy. But Sergeant Hall describes Travis McMichael as his mentor in the United States Coast Guard when they were in the Coast Guard together. They were roommates for years, uh, according to Sergeant uh, Hall. Um, they worked together on search and rescue and law enforcement cases. Um, he always found, and I'm paraphrasing uh, sections of the letter for you uh, to make it shorter, but he's basically telling the court that, he, that Travis McMichael is professional, well-mannered, and a respectful person that he's a reliable friend who will drop what he's doing to help anyone out, that he's so funny he ought to have his own TV show, that he doesn't go looking for trouble, and in no way, shape, or form is he hateful towards any group of people, uh, nor does he look down on anybody based on race, religion, or beliefs. This is from Sergeant Hall. Um, he says, in his opinion, that he knows Travis McMichael is a good human who would never harm the innocent and would follow any orders of this court if he were to be granted bond, for what it's worth. Your Honor, I also have <clears throat> affidavits, uh, Travis McMichael exhibit number 29, it's an affidavit of Matthew Albenzi, who is a witness in this case, an affidavit, it's number uh, 30, from John Ronald Olson, O-L-S-E-N, uh, a witness in this case in an affidavit from Diego Perez, uh, Travis McMichael, exhibit number 31. These three men live uh, on Centella Drive. I'm sorry, two of them live on Centella Drive. One, I think, lives on Jones Road, if I'm, if I'm uh, being accurate, Jones Road. All three are witnesses expected to be called either by the prosecution or the defense. The purpose of the affidavits is all three men swear under oath that they've uh, encountered no situations with Travis McMichael in which he's tried to intimidate them, get them to change what they saw or heard, uh, or change their testimony in any way, and they don't fear that if granted a bond that Travis McMichael could in any way or would in any way attempt to uh, obstruct justice or the administration of justice by getting them to change their testimony 
or intimidate them into not testifying at all. In fact, all three, uh, if not called by the state, would be called by the defense. So I would tender these three exhibits into evidence. No objection. Thank you. And with that, Your Honor, uh, we rest. Sure. My understanding in discussions during the break is at this point, Ms. Greg, excuse me, Greg McMichael's team would like to present their case since my response um, is largely geared towards the both of them. <coughs> I think that that would be an advisable procedure if that's okay with the court. That's fine. Very good. Your Honor. Aside from a jury verdict, this is the most important decision that directly impacts the life and the liberty of anyone who's facing criminal charges. But fortunately, our U.S. Supreme Court and our Georgia Supreme Court makes it clear that in our society, liberty is the norm, and that detention prior to trial is the, quote, carefully limited exception. For a lifelong Brunswick native with no criminal history, a veteran having proudly and honorably given almost three decades of public service to this community, in a strong and stable marriage who has earned the respect and trust of reputable people who care for him and this community, and sadly, who suffers from significant health issues that necessitate his proximity to life-giving health care providers here in the Brunswick community. The overwhelming weight of this case, Your Honor, of our presentation to you, will answer for the court comfortably the Ayala factors that Greg McMichael poses no significant risk of flight or failing to appear in court when ordered to do so, no significant danger to persons or property in this community, no significant <coughs> danger of committing another felony, and no significant danger of intimidating witnesses or otherwise obstructing justice. I want to begin and or if you will give me this direction, you have all of our exhibits, the way that the order. So the, what I brought with me to Glen County are the flash drives. I did not bring up all of the printed documentation. All right, so very good. Submitted in a couple of different formats. I'll do that. We'll do it in a couple of different ways. I'd like to tender Defendant Greg McMichael's Exhibit 1. It is a certified GCIC. And this certified GCIC shows for the court the date of birth of my client and the status of his criminal history. So I tender defendant's exhibit number one. No. <coughs> Your Honor, when you were to, uh, to look at this document, you will see that Greg McMichael is 65 years old. And in those 65 years, he has absolutely no criminal history. The only entry on this GCIC is the event we're here for today. Now, for, I'll take your direction as well. Would you like me to just hold on to them or continue to provide them up to you? Since it's going to be set, why don't you hold them? We'll, just give them the, we'll, we'll go through each one as Very far as tenor. Uh, we'll do the pile the other. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Now, exhibits two through eight, <laughs> I'm going to tender them. The government has, the state's been provided with them, and these are all Navy records. I note that Navy records are not nice and neat like we appears the Coast Guard records are, but that probably has something to do with how very old they are. And generally, Defendant's Exhibit Number Two is a two-page document showing an enlistment contract with the United States Naval uh, Reserves on February 18, 1975, for Greg McMichael. 
I did. I, I'm sorry. I was tendering all of them. I have no objection to the admission of any of those documents. Of two through eight. Two through eight. Are... Number three, Your Honor, is a re-enlistment agreement dated September 24th, 1975 in the regular Navy, into the United States Navy, for Greg McMichael. Defendant's Exhibit Number Four is the way the history of assignment report from the United States Navy, showing his entry and his assignments from February 10th, 1975, to his discharge in November of 77. When actually it shows on the report he was a patient, um, he had an accident and finished up his naval career after surgery. That was Number Four. Defendant's Exhibit Number 5 shows an honorable discharge from the United States Naval Reserve and then another honorable discharge from the United States Naval Reserve in Exhibit 6 after he had done uh, full reserves until 1981. I will state as well that we tried to get all of the records and I don't know why we didn't have a certification of Greg McMichael's honorable discharge from the United States Navy proper, but in fact, he did receive an honorable discharge. And finally, defendant's exhibit, actually two finalists, defendant's exhibit number seven is a classified assignment for Greg McMichael in January of 1976, where he was granted secret security clearance. And finally, Defendant's Exhibit Number Eight is a Sixth Fleet letter of commendation, telling all who would listen that there was a citation granted to Airman McMichael for his heroic performance while serving in Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron Two in September of 1976. Airman McMichael's quick response and disregard for his own personal safety contributed significantly to the successful rescue of his shipmate. Airman McMichael's courageous and prompt actions reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Sixth Fleet. Your Honor, I would now like to call Lee McMichael. Sworn. Can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. All right, and you're close enough to the microphone so you can be heard? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. If you can scoot a little bit up, it's a little hard for me. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. McMichael, you've already been here, so we have, the judge has some sense of who you are and where you fit in here. How are you related to Greg McMichael? And his wife. Okay, and I, it's really hard for me to hear you, so no, I'm sorry. going to need you to maybe, does that chair move? I don't know if it, no, it does not. Okay, so can we move the microphone? How's if that? you sit up a little bit more, that might help me. Thank you. Is that better? That's way better. Thank you. Ms. McMichael, we've, uh, uh, I will take the liberty of just summarizing most of what you said earlier, that you are born and were raised in Brunswick since the late 1950s. Your parents 
uh, came into Brunswick in 57, and that the only time you left city of Brunswick is when you went to college at ABAC in Tifton. That's correct. What did your father do for a living? He was a physician. When did he become a physician? I'm not sure what year. Um, what, what sort of doctor was he? He was in general practice. Did he practice in Brunswick? He did. What sort of practice? <laughs> he, general practice. Did he have any practice outside the Brunswick, Georgia area? He did. Tell me about that. He um, had a, a clinic on Sapelo Island. How did that get established? Um, my, bro my brother is a marine geologist and worked at the Marine Institute of Sapelo. And he used to go over there with my brother and met some of the residents over there, fell in love with them, found out that they didn't have access to medical care unless they came to Brunswick via ferry. Some of them didn't come. So he decided he would bring medicine to them every other weekend. Did he continue that tradition for some time? Uh, he started in the late 60s, early 70s, and I think it ended like 10 years later. Did you ever go over there with him? All the time. Did other members of your family go over there? Yes, we did. Was it an important part of your childhood? Did it have any effect, do you think, on forming your own opinions and attitudes um, about a number of things in your world? Yes, it did. It was very important. Is there still any marker, as far as you know, that honors your father over on Sapelo? I believe the clinic is still there, and his name may still be on it. What is your occupation? I'm an RN. And you testified earlier that you've been an RN for 32 years. Yes, ma'am. You're in utilization review now. Were you ever, did you ever practice in patient care? I did. In what sort of areas? Well, at first I started, when I came out of nursing school, I started in orthopedics and urology on the floor as a floor nurse. For 10 years I went into home health for a year, emergency med for three years, and then hospice care for 10 years. How did you meet Greg? Um, it was before school, before nursing school. I was um, a cashier at a local discount store, and he had just gotten a job at the Glen County Police Department, and he was um, security at that store. Second a police job. officer security or a second job? Second job. I see. And when, about when would that have been? That was like... Uh, September of 1982. As you dated, did you come to know his family as well? Yes, he, yes. Where was Greg born and raised? Brunswick. How long did the two of you date? About 10 months. Now I want you to see in front of you on your right, there's a group of things. There we go. So first I'm going to ask you some questions about them. And we can, if we keep them in that order, it might go smoothly. I want you to take a look at Defendant's Exhibit Number 9. What is that? Yes, our wedding. That is your wedding? And where were you married? We were married at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Brunswick. Here in Brunswick? Mm -hmm. uh, your Honor, I tender Defendant's Exhibit Number 9. No objection. So your wedding date, August 20th, 1983? 82. 83, 83. I'm sorry. 83, 83. that's all right. <laughs> Is that the case then, Ms. McMichael, that this August you celebrated your 37th wedding anniversary? It is. And that would have taken place while your husband was at the Glynn County Jail? It, it did. Do the two of you have children? We do. I want you to turn now to Defendant's Exhibit Number 10 and tell us if you know what's in that photograph. That's our family, Lindsay and Travis and Greg. Your Honor, I tender Defendant's Exhibit 10. No objection. And if you're able to see, there, the sh photographs are being shown as well, but the ones that you have there are probably a little easier to see, okay? okay. So in that photograph, that looks like a young McMichael family. About how old is everyone there? Well, Travis was probably about eight or nine, maybe 10. Um, Lindsay was five. Golly, I can't remember how it was, about 40. Maybe. All right. 35, and Greg about 39. You testified earlier that Lindsay is how old? 
She's 30. And that she is a student right now living at home with you. She is. pursued that field because of money? No, ma'am. Right. Has your husband ever shot anyone? No, ma'am. You say that very quickly. Is that important to Greg McMichael? It is very important to him. Why do you think that's important to him as a law enforcement officer never to have shot anyone? Because there's been so many opportunities that he, he, he could, did not have to use it. He did not have to use his gun. Did, would you say that that's a relief to him? That is. When Greg McMichael was working in the Brunswick Police Department in the Glynn County, but Glynn County. Glynn County Police Department as well, both, do you understand that he worked with a diverse group of colleagues, men, women, uh, people who had money, people who didn't, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, all sorts of diverse people. Yes, ma'am. And do you, are you aware of whether there has ever been a single complaint from a colleague about Greg McMichael being, uh, having mistreated him or her as a result of the diversity in that office? No, ma'am, no complaints. Are you aware if there's ever been any internal affair or a personnel investigation against him or him having mistreated anyone of a colleague? No, ma'am. Now, as a police officer, he is helping a diverse group of citizens in Brunswick. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, people, white, black, young, old, poor, rich. Are you aware of whether there's ever been a single problem that's been lodged or complaint that's been lodged against Greg McMichael in all those years of public service for him having mistreated a member of the public? No, ma'am. Has there ever been an internal complaint that had to be investigated? No, ma'am. Has he ever had to appear before any internal investigation board for such a thing? No, ma'am. And one more time, at the district attorney's office, he had colleagues that were diverse. He dealt with a public, witnesses, suspects, victims who were diverse. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Are you aware of there ever having been a single complaint lodged against Greg McMichael to his boss, to the courthouse, to Glynn County personnel that he had mistreated a member at the district attorney's office? No, ma'am. How about having mistreated any member of the public while he was a DA investigator? No, ma'am. Does your husband have a motto mm -hmm. about how he intends to treat everyone? Yes, ma'am. Can you state that for us? He, he always believed to treat people how you want to be treated, to treat people with respect. 
Did that matter who the person was he was dealing with? It did not matter who it was. Did it matter if it was a witness or a victim or a suspect? It didn't matter. Did it matter in far, as far as you understood whether the person he was dealing with was white or black or brown? It doesn't matter. In 2019, Greg retired from public service, is that right? Yes. Do you know why? His health. Generally, what the problem was? Well, he's had two heart attacks and a total hip, and he was just ready to retire. As his wife and as a nurse yourself, do you understand that your husband has significant health issues that yes. must be addressed? Yes, ma'am, I do. Do you, when Greg McMichael was not in custody, was he diligent about maintaining his medical protocol so as to stay alive? Because of me, yeah. <laughs> okay. Would you ever tell him, hey, Greg, it's time for an appointment, and he'd say, forget it, Lee, I'm not up for it? No, he would not. Okay. Do you know right now of any physicians, any specialists that he should have been and needs to continue to see on a regular basis? His cardiologist, um, gastroenterologist, and we need to do a follow-up on a neurologist. I want to show you, if you take a look at Defendant's Exhibit Number 11, do you see that photograph? I do. Do you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, I tender Defendant's Exhibit 11. No objection. What is that a picture of? That's of Greg holding a couple of fish. What were Greg's plans, the plans that you all had together for him after his retirement? He was, had planned to get his captain's license and do ecological tours and history via boat. Was he qualified to do such a thing? He was. Do you know how he earned that kind of qualification? Well, he worked with the Department of Natural Resources forever. That's how he learned how to do the boat. He also took the test for his captain's license. I want to turn your attention to the Department of Natural Resources. If you would look in there, there should be an Exhibit 22 piece of paper maybe at the back side? There it is. All right. Do you see what that is? Yes, ma'am. Who is that letter from? Um, Glen County Board of Commission. Oh, not that one. <laughs> right, is that Exhibit 22? That's 21. All right. I don't see a 22. Let's put it up. Well, all right, well, I'm going to... Wait a minute, here, I did. here it is. Here I did? Okay. Yes, ma'am, I did. All right, very good. And who is that letter written by? By Mr. Jim Music. Do you know Mr. Music? I do know Mr. Music. How do you know him? Um, he worked with Greg at the uh, Department of Natural Resources. What um, did the two of them do together? Uh, I think that Jim was a, um, a biologist, and Greg worked on the research vessel. When he worked on the research vessel, Greg, I mean, where did his research vessel go? In, to different places, um, different islands. What, um, if, and were there any islands that that vessel went to that you're familiar with? Sapelo. So was there a full circle that uh, surprised you when you all met? Yes, there was. What was he doing at Sapelo? Um, do you mean when, during the, when he was working? Yes. I, I'm not sure if he was um, probably doing research on dragon nets for shrimp and that kind of thing for the research vessel. When you and Greg would discuss his memories of his time at Sapelo, how would he describe that time? He enjoyed it. He, um, they would meet up with at dock and spend the night, spend weekends over there, um, uh, play football, um, just hang out sat low, you know, with the people and everything. Do you know why Jim Music isn't here today and yes. had to write a letter? Yes, I do. Can you tell us why? Because he's hunting. Okay. Was it a, a already planned trip? Yes, it was. Out of state? Out of state. All right. Prepaid is what I heard. <laughs> so I'd like now for us to take you back, and I want to talk about sometime before February 23rd. When the two of you were married, where did you live? 
um, when we were first married? Yes. We lived in a small apartment around the corner from my parents. In which, which city? Here, Brunswick. How long ha have you and Greg lived in Brunswick together? All of our life. Really. All your marriage? Mm -hmm. Now you live in uh, the same neighborhood where the event that we're here about today took place. Is that yes. right? Yes, ma'am. And you were living there on February 23rd. Yes, ma'am. You, how long had you been living in that home, in this, in the Satilla Shores neighborhood, at the time of February 23rd? Uh, six and a half years. Were you buying or renting? Renting. That home? Who was your landlord? Connie Scroggs. On February 23rd, who was living at that home with you? Travis, um, Lindsay, and Everett was there. I want you to take a look at exhibits 12, 13, and 14, and tell me if you recognize those photographs. I do. I want to tender 12, 13, and 14, Your Honor. No objection. Who is that in Exhibit 12, Lee? Yes, Greg and Everett. Everett is his grandson? About how old is Everett in that photo? Gosh, I don't know. Um, maybe about nine months to a year. Now if you would turn to Exhibit 13, what's in that photograph? Greg and Everett. Is Everett a little older there? Yes, he is. And now if you turn to Exhibit 14, That's Greg and Everett. A little bit older there? Yes. The living arrangement, as I understand it from your previous testimony, is that Nicole and Nicole, who is Everett's mother, and Travis, who is Everett's father, have a very cordial relationship so that Everett spends every other week at a house. Right. So a week with dad over at grandma and grandpa's and a week with mom. Right. Then back at dad's and grandma and grandpa's. Right. Was that a living arrangement back in February that you look f back to with happiness? Yes. How important a part of Greg's life is his grandson Everett? He's number one, most important. Was he actively engaged in Everett's care? He was. He, um, he, sometimes he got him up, I mean got him to daycare because he was retired, so he got to get up and get him breakfast and get him settled. Sometimes he picked him up early. Um, and when the COVID came about, he would keep him at home until Travis got there. Well, Greg McMichael has raised his children. And how did he feel about having everyone back at home again? It was stressful, but it was, we had happy times. How did he feel about having a four-year-old in the house every other week? He loved it. So now, Lee, I want to talk about some things that are uncomfortable to talk about in a courtroom with people you don't know, but this is what we've got to do today. You were asked earlier about your financial situation. Mm -hmm. What money comes in every month, not the amounts, to cover your expenses? My salary, Greg's um, pension, and he's got Social Security. You testified earlier that you're renting a home. Was there a financial problem that resulted in your having to rent and not buy? Yes, we, during the crash, we ended up going bankruptcy and losing our home. Is that why you told the government earlier, the state earlier, that you have literally no nest eggs? Yes, right. Now here's another incredibly private thing that we're going to ask you about because it's important and that's the stability of your marriage, Lee. You had your 37th anniversary just a couple of months ago. How would you describe the strength of your marriage to Greg McMichael? Very strong. What are you basing that on? I'm basing it on our past. Um, we've been through so much. Uh, a lot of hard times that it, we just get stronger every time we go through something. So you think the trials that you've had over the last 37 years have strengthened you? Yes, ma'am. 
Do you mind telling us briefly some of those significant trials that instead of pulled you apart, drew you closer together? Well, when, we, when Travis was nine months old, I decided to go back to school, and Greg took care of Travis while I went back to college to get my nursing degree. Um, he took it 50-50. Um, when I graduated and had Lindsay, I worked straight nights. He worked days. So he was there at night. I was there. He got up, got him to school. I got him fed, and he made sure they were bathed and in bed for 10 years. And then, of course, losing both our parents was bad. But then I came down with cancer 2003, I think it was. Um, and I was sick for about two or three months. And he did everything. He took care of the kids. All I did was stay in bed and go to treatment. And he took care of the kids and did everything. Was the bankruptcy another one of those stressors that you say, yes. instead of driving you apart, brought you back closer? It did. It was. You've continued to stay at the house in Satilla Shores. Yes. Do you know your neighbors pretty well? Very well. For the most part, have your neighbors been supportive? Yes. Have you received threats? Yes. How have you reacted to those threats so that you're comfortably safe? Well, I've got security set up. I've got um, I've got a, two dogs, a little yapper and a big boy. And I've got, um, I turn them over to, if there are threats that warrant, I turn them over to the police and GBI. When was Greg arrested? May 7th, 2020. Since that time, have you visited him? Yes. How often do you visit Greg? Every visiting day. Twice How often is, are you allowed to visit him? Twice a week. What days are those? Saturday and Wednesday. For how long? 15 minutes. Do you, and you say you've attended all those visitations? Yes, ma'am. Are they contact visitations? No, are you able to touch each other? No, ma'am. How do you communicate? With a phone and a plexiglass. I want you to look at Exhibit 15 and tell me if you recognize that photograph. Yes, I do. Uh, Your Honor, I tender Defendant's Exhibit 15. No objection. Lee, who is in that picture? Greg and Everett and Travis. When you found that picture, was it at my direction? Yes. And what was my request for you? What was the last picture you have of Greg that before he got arrested? All right. And when you look at your husband, uh, do you remember the date when you looked on your photograph? I think this was April. All right, April of 2020, 2020. and the arrest was May 7th. Do you, how does your husband compare physically to how he was in April of 2020? How does he compare now and appear to you? Thinner, paler, weaker. Well, let's talk about each of those. You say thinner. Are you aware of whether your husband has lost any weight in the six months he's been at the Glen County Sheriff's yes, Department? Ma'am. How much weight? About 45 pounds. You say weaker. What do you see physically to explain how you believe he's weaker? His body posture just looks you're going like this. Is that bent yes, over? Yes, bent over. Just body posture. And you say his color is paler. Yes, it is. Are you aware of whether your husband, from the day of his arrest to today, has ever been out taken outside yes, since he's been at the Glen County Sheriff's Department? He has. When? The day before yesterday. Is that the first time he was taken outside in the six months he was here? Yes, ma'am. The first time he saw the sunshine, the first time he got out of the jail? It was, it was raining. Okay. And do you know how long he was allowed outside? No, I don't. You're a nurse. Your husband was a law enforcement officer and a district attorney's investigator. Both careers dedicated to helping people. Did you... Was that an important part of your decision making and when you talk about the strength and stability of your marriage that you are both in those helping professions? Yes, ma'am. 
do you and Greg share the ups and downs in your accomplishments with each other? Yes, ma'am. Were you proud of his achievements as a law enforcement officer? Very proud. How about his accomplishments as a DA investigator? Very proud. And were you aware of some of the commendations, some of the rec uh, recognition that he's received throughout the years for these accomplishments? Yes, ma'am. I'm now going to tender, Your Honor, exhibits 16 through 20 that have been provided to the state. These are the commendation and recognition that he's received in some of the major cases that he's worked. No objection. Thank you. If you would put up number 16, I want to point out, Your Honor, this is a letter to Eugene Rain. Is it Rain or Ramey? The chief of police in Glynn County back then? Well, it's R-A-M-E. In September of 1985, a letter of commendation that was prepared by the chief of police. And I just want to note this language. Were it not for your determination, perseverance, and cooperative spirit, a violent criminal might still be at large in our community. Your use of restraint and common sense during the pursuit is well noted and the citizens of Glynn County are indeed fortunate to have such a dedicated officer as yourself to rely upon in times of need. Exhibit 17 is from the Department of Navy to the Chief of Police Eugene Rain. Recognizing the work that the Glynn County Police Department did in helping apprehend absentee and deserters in the Marine Corps and asking the Chief of Police to note the pleasure that the Captain of the United States Marine Corps, D.L. White, has in sharing and providing the enclosed Certificate of Appreciation for the professional efforts put forth by Detective Greg J. McMichael effecting the arrest and detainment of the Marine Corps absentee deserter. Number 18 is a February 2003 letter from the Department of, Eight of Treasury, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms from Hugo Barrera, the special agent in charge, to the district attorney at that time, Stephen Kelly, thanking District Attorney Kelly for making available to ATF the services of Investigator McMichael. And I'll point out that ATF says, Investigator McMichael provided outstanding assistance that was indispensable during the investigative phases of this case. His expertise and professional conduct displayed while working with the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, as well as his continued cooperation in our agent's absence, were exemplary. Please convey my appreciation to Investigator McMichael in his unwavering assistance and dedication to duty in removing this violent felon from our streets. Exhibit 19, a May 2003 letter from John Albert Dow III, attorney at law in Brunswick, to the Honorable Stephen Kelly, thanking Stephen, letting the court, excuse me, letting the district attorney know that Mr. McMichael was an incredible assistance involving threats and threatening phone calls made to Mr. Dow's residence. He ends the letter by saying, and Greg, please know that I'm supremely Judge. impressed with your investigative Sorry. skill and professional Sorry. demeanor. I'm Sorry to interrupt, but and I've, I've tried not to object, but I believe she's on direct, so question and answer I think would probably be better use of the time from the state's perspective. So I object to um, the form of the question or absence thereof. I have no question, Your Honor. I'm just interlacing the exhibits that have already been authenticated in the middle of this direct examination. Uh, at the time of your minute, um, since we have a witness on the stand, let's get the testimony on the Very good, Your Honor. There were only one left, and that was number 20, and the court will have the opportunity to take a look at that. Ms. McMichael, I'm going to you see exhibit 21 in front of you. That would be, you see that? I think I left that with you. 
Yeah. Lynn County Police Department. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you yeah. <laughs> can you identify that document? It's a separation of notice from um, from County Board of Commission. All right. Uh, tender Exhibit 21, Your Honor. No objection. That is the separation notice, is that correct? Yes, it is. Meaning it's telling from the amount of time that your husband gave in service to Glynn County? Yes. Do you see the dates of beginning service and the dates of end service? I do. Will you read those? 11 1 1995 is the beginning, and the ending service is May 31st, 2019. That's 24 years? Yes, ma'am. Ms. McMichael, do you know of any time in the 38 years you've been with Greg McMichael that he has attacked or caused physical harm to anyone? No, no. And since February 23rd, during the time he had at home and the time he's been in jail, has Greg McMichael ever said or done anything that made you concerned that if given the chance, he wouldn't be coming back for his trial. No, ma'am. Do you have an opinion about whether your husband poses any risk of flight? He, he poses no risk of flight. Why do you think that's the case? Because he wants, he wants his day in court. He wants, he, he's not going to run from his responsibility and he wants to be proven innocent. I have no more questions. Ms. McMichael, I will um, try very hard not to recover anything that we talked about this morning, though some of it um, now pertains to your husband versus Travis McMichael. So I do have some questions on that, and I think you understand that, correct? Um, you're, it goes without saying that the same stands true of your relationship with your husband as with your son. You're supportive of him and love him very much, correct? That's correct. And um, as with this morning, you confirmed for us that you don't know all of the facts of this case, just what's been told to you and what you may have seen in the media and otherwise, correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, we had talked about uh, the social media post by your daughter, Lindsay. That post was actually made with a picture of the crime scene while she was under your roof. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Uh, since we're, we're again talking about money and about income sources, I want to ask a little bit about the three total sources of income that you identified. Salary, correct? Yes. Pension? Yes. And that's um, defendant, Greg Michael's pension, correct? Right. And then social security. Uh, tell me about the GoFundMe page um, that's been uh, set we up for support. Page. You, you do not? We do not. Okay. Are you aware of any supporters that have set up a GoFundMe page on your behalf? I am not aware of any supporters that have a GoFundMe page. Okay. Um, you were asked about internal complaints and um, your husband's retirement. You, you know that on two occasions, his post-certification lapsed because of his failure to keep up with what his requirements were, correct? I didn't, I didn't know of that, yes. Okay. And um, in fact, the reason that he left the service of the Glen County District Attorney's Office was uh, in, in, in lieu of being fired, is that correct? No, that is not correct. I don't assume that you have access to the post records, um, that being the police officer standard and training council, um, by chance do you? Have you seen any of those? I've seen the letters that he's gotten. All right. Let's talk a little bit about neurologists. You mentioned that um, for the first time, I think, this afternoon. What is the neurological condition that's of concern that requires your husband to see a neurologist? He had a stroke. Okay, all right, so that's related to the heart conditions as well. Well, it may be, it may not be. Okay. Uh, regardless of what that neurological condition is, you agree that your husband does have the capacity and does know the difference between right and wrong? He does. Okay. 
the, the bankruptcy that you had mentioned for, for your family, when was that, that you had to declare bankruptcy? I cannot remember. It was in, um, it's when the, the, the crash hit, 2000. I don't know. All right, that's fine. Are, are you out of bankruptcy now, you we and your are, family? We okay. Are. So you've left bankruptcy. We have. Do you recall when that, that was? Yes, that was after we got the rental house. So that was probably uh, five years ago. All right. Um, since it was brought up on direct, I want to delve into it just briefly. You mentioned the uh, fact that uh, you and your family had received some threats, is that correct? Yes. Um, when those threats were received, you did reach out to the state through the GBI and through police to have them investigated, correct? Absolutely. And um, the GBI and police uh, took it upon themselves to investigate those threats just as they've been investigated this case? I guess. In addition to the two times that you visit with your husband, uh, Greg McMichael a week you've had a number of phone conversations with him just as you've had conversations with Travis correct of course staying on the health conditions here um, having observed your husband during these visits and having talked to him during any of the visits that you and your husband have had with this doctor um, were there concerns expressed about his weight and how that might impact his his heart condition was he yeah. asked to lose weight what is his weight? Yeah, no. Was he asked to lose weight by his medical professional? I doctor? don't remember if he was or not. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, phone calls. You and your husband discussed the idea that character witnesses might be called on his behalf as part of this bond here. Do you, you recall that? I don't recall that. Uh, you know who Mario Morales is? Yes, I do. Okay, there was a particular call where you told your husband you thought it was a bad idea for Mario to be called as a character witness. I did. Okay, so let, let's start first by identifying who he is. He's a former Glen County police officer. Right. right? And um, how is it that your husband and you know who Mario... I, I object. I, I uh, received a very specific list that I was told that jail call, Your Honor, so it wouldn't be on that list. And she's acknowledged the conversation. I'm just going to talk to her about the substance of it. I've been given a list that includes Mario Morales as a potential witness that would be called during this bond hearing. I know that she and her husband had conversations about that uh, from our investigation. I'm asking her about one of those conversations. I've got tons of those bond hearings. I had just, after a few times, I did actually bring down hard copies of the number five. And what you're referring to is the tons of those bond hearings.
My question was regarding Mr. Mario Morales, um, and I think you indicated that he was a former Glynn County police officer, correct? Yes. Did he work with your husband when your husband was employed there? Yes, I did. You came to know him as well through that relationship, yes. that work relationship. You told your husband that you thought it was a bad idea for Mario to be called as part of this bond here. Why is that? Because I was worried about with the threats that I got and the harassment our friends have had that with his job that he may lose his job. Is uh, Mr. Morales still with Glenn County Police Department no, or are you aware that he's, he's no longer there? He's no longer there. So, so that risk of employment loss uh, doesn't necessarily apply anymore in terms yes. of Glenn County? Not Glenn County, but it does apply. I want to talk uh, about some jail calls, some of which we covered on Travis. Now I need to talk about some of your calls with your husband. <laughs> Uh, specifically, I want to talk about May 16th. Do you remember having a, a discussion with your husband about Lindsay and the advice that your husband gave you that you needed to have her delete her social media? I do. And um, specifically, he told you they're going to go back and look at what she posted. Do you remember that? I don't remember him saying that. Okay. And um, he made a distinction between merely closing them out and actually oh. deleting, bless you, deleting um, the, the social media. Do you remember that discussion? I remember him wanting her off of social media, yes. All right. D did you, in fact, follow his request and ask your daughter to delete social media? She has, was already deleted from social media. Let me direct your attention to the next day, May the 17th. Um, there was a discussion between you and your husband, uh, during which your husband says, did, did they get my account killed? Is that correct? You remember that? Yes. When you're talking about getting my accounts killed, is that in reference to social media and phones? It's phone, social media. Who is Lee that you reference in that in, in that phone call? Lee is the investigator with the, the um, defense. Okay, so, so was it Lee that you were working with to get that account killed as your... Uh, no, Lee had the phone. He was not killing the account. I got you. All right. Just one minute. Thank you, Max. Ms. McMichael, how did you feel when you discovered that your daughter had posted a picture of the scene on her Facebook page? Horrified. Why? I'm disgusted. It's, uh, it was a bad judgment call, and she has been tormented and harassed ever since. How did your husband, Greg McMichael, feel about what she did? Objective speculation. Had you and Greg discussed how he felt about what his daughter yes, did? Yes. And what did he convey he to you? He was furious. You were asked whether your husband was about to be fired from the district attorney's office. Will you let us know why that is not the case? Because we had planned retirement a year in advance. He had a retirement date already set. My husband did not have he did not have arrest powers that last few months, so what he did was he worked in the office uh, between the police department and um, in Camden and the DA's office until he retired. Um, he never arrested anyone anyway in his duties. Do you, do you know whether a DA investigator even, even has to be a post-certified officer? I don't think so. All right. And so do you understand that this was an agreement that he and his boss reached for him to finish out the year that he wanted before he retired? Absolutely. Have you ever heard from his boss or from him or from anyone before Mr. Evans the phrase, instead of being fired? I never heard that before. He planned his retirement. The neurologist. Tell us about the stroke. Uh, as his wife and being intimately familiar with it and as a nurse, what did that stroke do to him? Um, he's got a little bit of memory loss. Um, it's what part of his body did it initially hit? It, it hit his... It, there was really initially no signs, but then he woke up and he could not see out of his... I think it was his right eye part of it. Part he could see. 
And is that what the neurologist told you where it was impacted? It, he had a stroke in the eye itself plus a small stroke in his occipital lobe, but that didn't have anything to do with the eyesight. That was right. And you're pointing to the back for yes, us the back, nurses. Yes, the back, the occipital, right, the back. The occipital lobe. All right. Your concerns about Mario Morales, which I still uh, cannot see the relevance of, uh, have you testified honestly as to why it is you were concerned about Mario? Had he conveyed those concerns to you? He did not convey them to me. I convey them because of the way we've had friends lose jobs. And um, I know his position is pretty sensitive and I worry about him being associated with Lucy's job. And as a nurse, and after, based as well on your meetings with your husband's doctor, what risks are they that a person who has suffered a stroke will suffer another one. Are yeah. they increased? Yes. I have no more questions. No, sir. Maybe we step down.
Rudolph? Yes. Hi, I'm over here. If you would introduce yourself to the court and tell us how you spell your last name. Uh, Linton Jordahl, J-O-R-D-A-H-L. Mr. Jordahl, where do you live? Not the actual address, but what city do you live in? Brunswick, Georgia. How long have you been living in Brunswick? With the exception of a detail to Washington, D.C. for four years. I've lived there since 1977. Family from around here, too? Yes. And did you raise your family here? Yes. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm retired now. I'm a reti retired federal employee. Can you go back to the beginning of your career <clears throat> as in the federal sector? Well, I started as in the U.S. Marshal Service. When did you start there? I started in 1970. What did you do in the Marshal's office? I was a deputy U.S. Marshal. For how many years? Well, in total, in counting the transfer back here for 15 years. As a U.S. Marshal, basically, what were your duties? Uh, court security, uh, serving process, warrants, witness protection, uh, civil disturbance. And then at some point, did you have uh, some deployment situations? Were you deployed at all at, or involved? Well, I, I've deployed uh, to, to situations involving civil unrest several times, uh, witness protection details, fugitive investigation details in various cities around the country. And was that all in the capacity, in your capacity as a U.S. Marshal? Yes. Before, that was your beginning in law enforcement. After the U.S. Marshals, what did you do? Well, after I transferred to a Federal Law Enforcement Training Center with the Marshal Service, and I was injured in the line of duty in 1982. And uh, then I worked for the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center as an instructor for a few years. Then I came back to uh, to a uh, criminal investigation position with the, U the uh, U.S. Forest Service. What sort of courses were you teaching? Uh, behavioral sciences and enforcement operations. So you did that until, bring us a little bit forward here. Well, I, I taught at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center until approximately 1993. Then I went with the U.S. Forest Service. <laughs> I transferred to uh, Washington, D.C., and I was the Assistant Director for Operations for Law Enforcement and Investigations until I transferred back to Fletzy in 1997. In 1997, I finished up as a, uh, as a representative of the U.S. Forest Service at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and I retired in 2000. And then you stopped retiring, is that right? I, I stopped retiring, and I, I worked uh, as a part-time doing uh, security clearances for various government agencies to the present. How do you do that? Well, I go out and interview people and talk to people, pull records, and so that they can get a national security clearance. Do you know Greg McMichael? Yes, I do. Do you recall how you met him? Vaguely. Can you tell us that? Well, approximately 1978 or 79, the late 1970s, I met him either uh, as a, as a member of the uh, local dive club here, scuba diving club, or in his official capacity, because at that time there had been a uh, double homicide on Jekyll Island, and uh, the Glenn County court system did not have the state-of-the-art uh, walk-through metal detectors at the time, <clears throat> and he spoke to me about uh, finding a, some marshal service uh, equipment that we could use for that high-threat trial. And did the two of you work together on getting that all Ready well, to go? He was just a point of contact and he made the references and because and, and, he likes to help people and he, he, I don't think it was even his responsibility, but uh, he, uh, he was kind of the point of contact to getting the equipment down to the court. So having met each other in a law enforcement capacity, uh, collaterally, and then having a, a mutual interest in scuba diving, did those two interests come together to create a friendship? Well, they created, created a friendship, a professional, and a, a friendship between families. Tell us about that. Well, the, uh, my, uh, my children's surrogate grandparents lived uh, just down the street from Greg McMichaels. So when I take the kids over to, uh, to visit with their surrogate grand grandparents, now deceased, uh, Greg, Greg knew the family also, so uh, he would come by and visit. And then his children would come by also at various times, about three or four times a year. 
in the period of time, and it sounds like it's a short period of time, that your work at, as a U.S. Marshal crossed over and, and intersected with Greg's work here at the Glynn County, in Glynn County. Did you see or sense any uh, deviation from protocol, from procedure when you were working with him? Not at all. Did you see anything different than that? How did you view his attention to detail and his reliability to follow the rules and the regulations? Well, from my experience, he was a, he was a professional law enforcement officer. He was friendly. He followed all known, you know, it, you know even from an outside agency, he followed all the protocols that I would expect that would be followed by uh, Glenn County. Did you maintain your friendship after this professional meeting and your families getting together? How often would you say, tell us about the development of your friendship over the last, it looks like, 30-some years? This is <clears throat> sporadic. It just, it just depended on my travel and his, 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 his work. But approximately three to four times a year, we would, uh, we would meet either at the uh, surrogate grandfather's house or uh, I visited his house in, in Brunswick, Georgia uh, a couple of times. And in all those years and the sporadic visits, especially with your relationship and your foundation in Brunswick, had you ever heard around Brunswick, around Glynn County, any disparaging comments about Greg McMichael's ability to deal with any sort of person on his job or socially? Rich people, poor people, women, men, white, black, did you ever hear that there was a problem that Greg would have in working with people that were different than him? Never. Have you continued to keep in touch with the McMichael family while Greg's been in jail? No, I haven't. And have you taken it upon yourself to want to help Greg in his efforts to be bonded out? Yes. Can I talk with you about that? You understand that a bond is a, oftentimes held by a security and uh, that some individuals can put up security based on the level of certainty they have that they're not going to lose their property. So have you made some offers to us, to the family, about your willingness to do such a thing? I've made that offer. Can you tell us about that? Well, I have. Uh when, it, when this incident first happened, I realized, <clears throat> realized that uh, this sort of thing would come up, and I was just waiting for the bail to be mentioned. And I spoke to my wife, and we agreed that uh, we would uh, sign over some uh, rental property that I had, just as a as a bond. And ballpark, do you have? A, did you look up an assessment, equity-wise, of the property that you would be willing to put up? For his security. Yes, the assessment was $108,000. Did you say 108 or 108? It was 108. Now, Mr. Jordahl, it seems to go without saying, but I'm going to have to say it. Do you have any concerns that Greg McMichael will flee if he is released on bond? Absolutely not. Do you have any concerns that he will not show up for court when ordered to do so? I have no concerns. And is your willingness to stake that feeling, stake your property on the certainty of that feeling, does that tell us anything about the certainty with which you have that opinion? Well, I'm, I'm certain of his character and his, the way he's dealt with people and dealt with me over the years. I've never seen anything negative, never seen anything derogatory or demeaning towards other people. Just a professional law enforcement person. And even though this is such a serious case, what makes you so comfortable in knowing that he'll be back in court when he needs to for his trial? Well, I feel I will. I know him well enough to make that decision. Thank you. No more questions. Mr. Jordahl, my name is Jesse Evans. I'm a prosecutor with the state of Georgia. I want to um, talk to you about uh, your testimony. I don't have a lot to ask you, but um, you started off knowing defendant 
merely as a point of contact for some law enforcement function involving your work with the marshal service that's my understanding well it's a vague recollection 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 because two things happened during that time frame in the late 70s one was the 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 need for a sophisticated walk-through metal detector here and the other was my association with the dive club so that's when I first met him okay so you're not precisely certain which of those two led to the relationship I cannot remember exactly which one during the time frame fair enough regardless you since solidified your relationship with the McMichaels family correct yes and you are here as a supporter of Greg McMichaels and his family correct yes admittedly you do not know the specific facts of the state's case against Greg or Travis McMichael other than perhaps what you've heard on the media or what some family member has told you correct that's correct would you agree with this assertion as a former law enforcement officer good character never excuses bad or criminal conduct you agree with that I agree with that let's talk about this property that you have you said a hundred and eight thousand dollars in equity in that property that's what it's assessed at okay is it encumbered in any way is there a mortgage or anything like that there is a mortgage in the amount of thirty seven thousand okay and is that property here in Glynn County yes Brunswick Glynn County Brunswick this is your property yes sir okay so you're willing to put your property up for defendant Greg McMichaels if he's granted a bond based on your relationship from with him over the years yes sir that's your testimony yes okay yes sir 